She was a leader in the United States labor movement. She was a social activist and she was a Guatemalan. She unionized workers, led strikes, wrote pamphlets in English and Spanish, convened the 1939 Congreso de Pueblos de Habla Española, which was the first uh, national uh, Latino civil rights assembly. Um, before she was voluntarily returned to Guatemala in 1915, after being pressured by the House on American Activities Committee to leave this country. She will be deported. As the Great Depression struck in 1929, and in order to support her daughter and unemployed husband, Moreno worked as a seamstress in Spanish Harlem. She organized her co-workers, most of whom were Latinas, into a garment workers union. And in 1935, Moreno was hired by the American Federation of Labor as a professional organizer. She left her abusive husband um, and settled with her daughter in Florida, where she unionized African-American and Latina cigar workers, cigar rollers. And she joined the Congress of Industrial Organizations, and she became a representative of what was known as UCAPAWA, the United Cannery Agricultural Packing and Allied Workers of America. She became the editor of its Spanish-language newspaper in 1940. So as an UCAPAWA representative, she helped organize workers at pecan shelling plants in San Antonio, Texas, and, at cannery, and cannery workers here in Los Angeles. There, were, there she encouraged alliances between, different, uh, uh, between workers at different plants. And her leadership was the type that empowered other workers, especially women, and she strongly encouraged women to take leadership roles in union organizations. And during the 1950s, under the second Red Scare known as McCarthyism, Luisa Moreno will be deported to Guatemala for being, quote-unquote, a communist sympathizer. And then there's another woman who put her life on the line larger than herself uh, because she was involved in her community and wanted her community to, to have social justice and economic equality. And her name was Emma Tenayuca. She was a labor organizer to farm workers in San Antonio, Texas in the 1930s and beyond, and she led Mexican workers' movements in Texas. Natania Yuka's first knowledge of the struggle uh, <clears throat> of working people came from visits as a young child to what was known as the Plaza del Zacate in San Antonio. This was a place where socialists and anarchists would, speak, would come to speak and work with families with grievances. And she was an integral part of the historical struggle to incorporate Mexican workers into progressive U.S. trade unions at a time when the overwhelming majority of Mexican workers were employed in low-paying, low-status sectors of the, country, of the economy. And then Ayuka was also instrumental in one of the most famous conflicts of Texas labor history, the 1938 strike at the Southern Pecan Shelling Company. And during the strike, thousands of workers at over 130 plants protested a wage reduction of one cent per pound of shelled pecans. Mexicana and Chicana workers were picketed, uh, who picketed were gassed, arrested, and jailed. And the strike ended after 37 days when the city pecan growers agreed to arbitration. And in October that year, the National Labor Relations Act raised wages to 25 cents an hour. Thousands lost their jobs the following years as operators decided to mechanize plants in the face of rising labor costs. But let's take a look at how the Chicano Studies uh, center at the University of Texas at San Antonio, especially the uh, women of Mecha, uh, honored her in this documentary. On a hot August night in 1939, San Antonio experienced the worst civil unrest in its history. A mob of 5,000 people converged on the municipal auditorium. Their purpose was to attack a group of Communist Party members meeting inside. But the focus of their anger was a slender young labor organizer and Communist Party leader named Emma Tenayuca. When they couldn't find her, they turned their anger on the seats and the windows and whatever else they could destroy. And in the days that followed, they frequently threatened to kill her. The woman who aroused such passions was raised on the west side of San Antonio by her grandparents. Her grandfather taught her to fish in the San Antonio River. She was one of 11 children. Uh, she and her younger sister, Maya and Carrie, went to live with the grandparents, her maternal grandparents. 
and I know that her uh, grandfather really nurtured her. He really nurtured her intellect. I think they would curl up in a chair and read the newspaper and, you know, look at the pictures and talk about what was going on, things like that. A trip to the Plaza del Zacate, now known as Milam Square, Emma's grandfather introduced her to the intoxicating world of political ideology. By the time she was 15, Emma was reading works by Karl Marx and such intellectuals of the Mexican Revolution as the Flores Magón brothers. By the time she was 17, she had been jailed for walking the picket line with workers striking against the Fink Cigar Company. By the time she was 21, Emma Tenayuca was known throughout San Antonio for her passionate support of better wages and working conditions for the city's laborers. She was a gifted orator and skilled union organizer, and her name was becoming anathema to the political establishment. All the elements were in place for her greatest confrontation. Since the late 19th century, pecan shelling had become one of San Antonio's major industries. 25% of the nation's pecans were processed here, mostly by Hispanic women working in sweatshop conditions at near starvation wages. In January 1938, the shelling companies dropped their payments for a pound of shelled pecan meat from seven cents to six cents. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. 12,000 pecan shellers went on strike. They asked Emma Tenayuca to lead them. Emma was everywhere, writing pamphlets, walking picket lines, giving fiery speeches. But soon, the power structure of the city spearheaded by the police descended on the strikers. Hundreds were arrested. Dozens were jailed, including Emma. The strike continued for months, and the strikers eventually won back their original pay. More importantly, they proved that workers had some power. But I think that she felt that she made a difference with the pecan sheller strike. She spoke of it as a beginning, um, because it, I think what it did is it gave people hope, and it gave people the knowledge that they could make a difference. After the strike was settled, Emma continued her efforts for the poor and the unemployed. But her affiliation with the Communist Party set up another confrontation. The one that left her running from a hysterical mob at the municipal auditorium. In a move that cost him his political career, Mayor Maury Maverick allowed the local communists to meet in the municipal auditorium. Maverick felt it was a free speech issue. Unfortunately, some disgruntled citizens didn't see it that way. Which is why Emma and other party members had to be hurriedly led to a safety under police escort. After that night, Emma adopted a lower profile. For the next 10 years, she continued to promote workers' rights, but she herself was forced out of the workplace. Shunned by San Antonio's business community, she could not find employment. In 1948, seeking a quieter life and a chance to earn a living, Emma left for California. She would not return for 20 years. When Emma once again took up residence in her native city, she hoped only to enjoy her extended family and settle into a quiet role as a public school teacher. Instead, she found herself honored as a pioneer Chicana, a Hispanic woman who had been ahead of her time as a feminist and civil rights activist. In 1981, she was included in an exhibit of notable Texas women at the Institute of Texan Cultures. In 1986, her achievements were recognized by the San Antonio Women's Hall of Fame, by Our Lady of the Lake University, and by St. Mary's University. In 1990, she appeared on the poster for the National Women's History Month. You know, there were times when I thought I might be lynched, said Emma, but I never thought I would be honored. There was kind of a debt of gratitude among her contemporaries 
by by that time, you know, the 80s and 90s, you know, we had, thank God, you know, we had minimum wage, you know, we had fair labor standards, we had social security, you know, we had uh, food stamps, things like that. So there was a recognition that, yes, you know, we don't let our citizens starve to death. We take care of the workers, our citizens. And so they realized she was really ahead of her time because that's what she was fighting for way back so many years ago. In a cruel twist of fate, Emma's brilliant mind succumbed to Alzheimer's disease. She died in 1999. But the world she left behind was changed, and Emma Tenayuka had helped change it. So again, who are these dangerous people, these socialists, these communists, these reds, these anarchists, these peoples who just don't seem to, to get it right that we live in a place that's uh, capitalism? Uh, who are these peoples? These peoples are the ones that have, are very instrumental in giving us the rights that uh, we so take for granted today in our generation. Uh, the right, uh, what this generation left us, an eight-hour day, overtime pay. Uh, they brought us the weekend. They got us Social Security. They got us uh, aids to families with dependent children. Um, these peoples put their lives on the line for us. They were immigrants. They were children of immigrants. Uh, they come from all the different directions of white, black, yellow, red beans, the green beans. Um, so let's, let's appreciate this generation, students, again. Um, they were involved in political democracy and, and they called not just for political democracy but also economic democracy, social equality and an interracial and gender discrimination. So for black people the New Deal was psychologically encouraging yet most blacks uh, 